All right, well, let's get going here. Good morning, or I guess good afternoon to our East Coast or European uh, dial-in individuals. I'm Managing Director and Chief Investment Officer Brad Long, and I'm super excited to have two of our colleagues here today uh, to showcase our private markets and a lot of the uh, interesting trends that are going on there. So Michael Sestarsik and Angelique Pappas are joining us. Not only are they depths of knowledge uh, in this space, but they're both great people to boot. So I think you'll really enjoy uh, the conversation. As a reminder, we have 30 minutes on the clock. Um, we will respect that 30 minutes. So we will get you out of here uh, at the half of the hour. If you have questions along the way, put them in the, cap, uh, the chat queue. <clears throat> We're happy to take them throughout. So just feel free to drop them in there. And then we will leave a little bit of time at the end. Uh, should you just have a burning question that you really want to leave just for the end, um, we'll grab it then. If we don't get to your questions, I promise, uh, reach out to us. We can address them uh, directly there. So with that, um, I'm excited for our conversation. Uh, you know, really, I'd like to start with, before we get into kind of the recent trends, just we might have some listeners that have maybe uh, a cursory understanding of private markets. So Angelique, why don't you give us just a little bit of what are private markets? What's the benefit of investing kind of at the 50,000 foot level, if you will, before we dive into some of the trends. Yeah, yeah. Happy to, to kick it off. And thanks, Brad. We're excited to chat with you today. Um, so there are a number of advantages uh, to allocating to or increasing an allocation to, to private markets, if you can take on the illiquidity and the administrative complexity, because those exist. I'll, I'll sort of hit the punchline first, which is our clients invest because of the potential outperformance, right? The potential return profile and alpha generation. Many people really refer to this as an illiquidity premium. We don't really, although it is an Ill illiquid asset, you know, we, we sort of think of it as more of a control premium. Unlike in public markets, private equity managers, they have decision-making power. Through their ownership interest, they can exert influence on the operations, on the capital structure, on the long-term strategy of the business. And the hope is that they add meaningful value to their portfolio companies, which you know, should translate to value for their investors. And then there is a diversification benefit. So allocating to privates, you know, it can di diversify an investment portfolio into companies, into assets that just aren't accessible in the public markets. And I actually think people are always sort of very shocked to find out that the number of private companies really vastly outweighs the number of, of public companies. So there are, you know, over 220,000 private companies with revenue above, let's call it 10 million, compared to about 5,000 public companies. So that's a really, really big difference. Um, so those are just a couple of, of benefits of allocating to, to privates. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. So jumping from perhaps the 50,000 foot view down to maybe just 30,000 feet. So you know, Michael, why don't you give us some some context of the macro environment and private equity? And I will say, we got a lot of, as you well know, we got a lot of questions in 2022 where, you know, investors looking at public markets, seeing the impact of the Federal Reserve's rising interest rates and what it's doing to, to public markets. On the private market side, at least in the calendar year of 2022, it, it you know, it felt a little bit steady as she goes. Now, here we are, you know, one year later with a little bit more data you know, give us what's going on uh, underneath the hood across privates. Yeah, absolutely. I think what what we've seen and what we expected to see is that uh, private assets are are not and private funds are not you know, immune to the, the shift in cost of capital. Um, and so I think when you see sharp moves in public markets, capital markets, it isn't an immediate reaction. It's everything honestly tends to slow down to stop until those can reset and, and people can see. These transactions take months to complete oftentimes, not a few seconds like happen in, in public markets. So it takes some time to, to adjust, but we've seen that um, and expected to see that you know, over the course of the past um, 12, to, 12 to 18 months. So and in a space where the leverage buyout is the dominant transaction, obviously a higher cost of debt and higher cost of capital is going to have a, a big impact. Um, and we've seen that, you know, in 2021, uh, average kind of debt to EBITDA kind of peaked at around seven times, just shy of seven times. We've started to see that come down in, in more recent transactions. Um, there's actually a group called LCD, tracks all the private debt syndications and, and, and data there. They've been doing it back to 1997. This is the first year 
where the contribution of purchase was actually greater in equity than it was in debt, meaning the debt part of the capital stack is actually accounting for less than 50% for the first time in, in over two decades. Um, and so that's obviously having an impact on um, funds. Um, investors are seeing that downstream in the capital raising. Uh, so you're seeing kind of that as, as one impact in the macro environment and follow on effects. Um, they're there again, not immediately, but, but over time. Um, one other area um, that kind of has transcended here, probably a little bit more in line with what we saw in, in public markets too, um, has just been discount rates going up, uh, high growth companies being valued at a little bit less today. Um, I think that's a pretty easy line of sight to, to see and, and understand and, and follow. Largely just multiples coming down, that's impacted the VC market, um, particularly the later stage venture capital market in a, in a, pretty, in a pretty material way. Um, and so it's a couple areas where we've really seen a shift in in some activity and activity over the the past few years or the past few months. Yeah, but but I, let me jump in here though, Mike, um, because there have been pockets of of increased activity, right? It's all not just sort of bad news. Um, you know, as you mentioned, the the increasing cost of capital coupled with reduced appetite amongst lenders means it's just more challenging to secure that financing. It's not impossible though. It, it's just more challenging. And we're hearing that sort of left and right from our GPs. So what have GPs done, right? They've shifted that attention to deals that are a bit easier to digest. And by that, I mean, um, re really just smaller in size. So the number of add-on acquisitions, which are always very prevalent in the market, but those have been increasing. And then, you know, one, I think really interesting dynamic is that for the first time in over a decade, the number of growth equity deals in the first half of 2023, it actually exceeded that of buyout deals, which again, ties back to interest rates as growth equity broadly is less reliant on, on the financing markets. So maybe, uh, Michael, double clicking on kind of the, the, the cap stack, if you will, and the fact that more equity uh, has come in now. Interest rates aren't higher than they've been since, you know, they're not at all time highs, right? But obviously we moved very quickly in this direction. So it surprised a lot of people. Do you think that that's something that the market will normalize to and debt will start to work its way back in? Is that also a function of perhaps a lot of money that has been raised? And so perhaps more uh, equity going in today and it's more of a secular shift? Like, how do you think about that really influencing that debt to equity ratio in the purchase on for LPs? Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd say over time, it works in a bit of a pendulum and that swings one way, maybe it's a little heavier on one side in which we've seen kind of debt contribution probably being higher than normal um, over the past few years, or we'll call it 2018 to, to 2021. And now that's swinging back more towards, towards the middle. So I think what we're seeing from a debt to EBITDA, a debt service coverage ratio, those things are, are probably more typical than, than atypical today. Um, and that's a, a big shift in what base rates have done. We haven't actually seen spreads blow out or widen substantially. It's been more the move in the base rate is is being sofer in most cases um, is what has what has really been the impact and and the shift there. Um, covenants tend to be pretty pretty market rate, and so there's not a lot of of uniqueness in terms of the covenants that are there or certain terms around if it's a kind of regular way, just leverage buyout transaction. Um, and so pendulum is definitely more balanced today than it was um, than it was a few quarters ago. Um, but over time, like we're not seeing that inhibit the ability to get deals done when rates were moving 20 to 50 basis points every single month or every other month for a period of time. That had a big impact because Again, in a transaction that takes three months from start to finish, if you can't understand like what your financing costs are, it's really hard to get to get that complete and and done um, because there's so many moving parts in the in the middle. Now that we've seen stabilization of okay, that's not happening. I think we've seen more activity pick up. The bid ask spread on what sellers are expecting and buyers are are asking for um, is is coming more in line as well. You're starting to see if there is still a gap there. You can start to see structure work its way into certain deals uh, to bridge that gap, whether it's via earnouts, uh, rollover, uh, seller financing, and so there are ways to to bridge small gaps in that too that we that we've seen. 
perhaps on the idea of the pendulum swinging. So, you know, you mentioned probably a little more debt than usual over the last, you know, number of years. Um, and when you think of the power dynamic between the equity stack and the debt stack, you know, it's it's been our view that a lot of that power has really lived with the equity, uh, you know, side of that equation, right? There's a, there was a lot of private debt that was raised. Uh, you can kind of line up those individuals and say, hey, you know, what is the rate you're willing to give me? And so they were, there lots of supply. And so the power was shifted, you know, on the equity side. Today, it feels like the power has shifted more uh, to the financing side, especially given the volatility that we saw in the banking system earlier this year and the need to help uh, kind of continue to close deals and, and put debt into uh, these purchases. So, Angelique, do you have a view there on you know, kind of that pendulum on credit and what that potentially means for GPs and how they're managing their portfolios and importantly, LPs and the opportunity set going forward? Yeah, I agree with you in that there's definitely been a supply demand shift compared to maybe a few years ago where private credit funds are probably in a slightly better position of power right now, um, but there's still a lot of them out there. A lot of money has gone into the space, meaning that they have to put it to work. So so there's competition, right? It's a competitive market. Um, you know, with that said, again, equity checks are higher, the cost of capital is higher, covenants are a little bit tighter. So one could argue that private credit is more attractive today than in previous years. With that said, you know, we still think there's an opportunity cost within the illiquid portion of a client's portfolio, right? So if you can only allocate 10% to Ill illiquid assets, you know, we still believe that private equity, especially sort of where we play, that will outperform for basically the same liquidity profile. Um, and now, I mean, you're actually kind of earning something in, in public fixed in income as well, where maybe you weren't a few years ago. So um, I think there are a lot of parts of your portfolio to consider. Um, and we certainly wouldn't say, you know, take uh, your private equity allocation and move it into, into private credit. Um, and then just from a, a GP standpoint, you know, I, I think you just they have to be more cognizant of their their financing partners and and what's happening in the debt markets because there is more power within private credit now that banks stepped back. Right. Maybe that to your point on the relative opportunity cost of performance, you know, Angelique dovetailing into the performance on, you know, the private equity side. So, you know, as we look at recent performance and given Michael's comments on you know, we're not immune to, you know, or private equity is not immune to higher costs of capital. Um, you know, and there's been a little bit more uh, kind of downside volatility, if you will, there. What what has performance looked like? And we did get a question in on the queue, especially in, you know, maybe uh, double clicking a bit on Michael's comments around venture capital um, and some of the, you know, results related there uh, in a rising interest rate environment. Yeah, yeah. I see Tim's question here. So on performance broadly, you know, Again, private market valuations and performance, it, it tends to lag behind public markets and it adjusts over time. You know, I think it's safe to say that we're probably on the other end of, of that adjustment. Buyout funds have been the strongest performer, right? They've actually held up quite well. If you look at venture capital and you look at growth equity, that does look very different. With venture one year performance down double digits, growth equity essentially flat. Um, and I'm commenting on through the second quarter of, of this year. But long-term performance, right, three, five, 10, 15 years, that, that remains quite strong. I think, you know, all of this just underscores the importance of portfolio construction and the importance of manager selection, right? Our clients' portfolios, they held in quite well because 50 to 60% of their private equity exposure is dedicated to buyout funds where we believe there is the best risk adjusted reward. And then, you know, if you take that one step further, even within buyout, the managers that we tend to invest in, you know, they're focused on the smaller end of the market, which tends to be less efficient, which tends to have more opportunities. And that actually goes back to sort of our earlier comment about larger funds being more active with add-on acquisitions, right? They're buying in the smaller part of the market. So they're buying from those lower middle market sponsors, uh, which gives the smaller guys uh, in a, an exit avenue, basically. Um, and then when it comes to, to leverage, we tend to partner with GPs that take a more conservative approach relative to the market. 
Um, I'd say broadly, they aren't struggling to secure debt because they weren't maxing out um, on the available you know, capacity of debt in the first place. So all of that has certainly helped in a rising interest rate environment. Right. So maybe taking the, you know, the, the other side of performance or making performance relative, right? Relative to what? And that's, you know, EBITDA or the value of which you're producing. So Michael, give us some thoughts on valuations today. You know, what with the recent performance pullback, has that made, uh, you know, valuations historically attractive, more relatively attractive? And then how should investors think about that? Because we often think in the public markets, which clearly we can move in and out of more fluidly, um, valuations are more attractive. I might be moving capital in that direction. Does it translate just as simply here in the private markets? Yeah, it, it definitely translates. I wouldn't say it's uniform across all spaces. So even under the hood, it's some things are doing better and still striking a at an evaluation that's as strong, or maybe even in some cases stronger than it was two, three years ago. Um, and in other cases, folks have have just generally pulled pulled back a bit. Um, and so one area that is is still garnering like very very robust valuations is anything associated with with AI. Um, it's definitely a bit of a hot dot. There's a lot of hype around it. A lot of rounds within VC funds are still very oversubscribed, um, and it's it's a little bit of a, a challenge for some VCs to to get into those deals. And so there you're you're seeing richer valuations and valuations that frankly haven't haven't come down you know, on the other end of the spectrum and we'll take kind of the two widest and work our way in here uh but i would say on the other end of that um is maybe the commercial office space um that's one where i think the expected range of outcomes of what does normal look like in a future environment is still really wide and people haven't come to consensus on what that looks like in addition to that you've got a lot of maturities in office and just commercial debt in, in general, that uh, commercial real estate debt in general that's coming due over the next few years. And what does that look like? What's going to be underwater? What's not going to be underwater? And nobody really wants to be the first one to step into that. A lot of folks are taking a wait and see approach. And as more people wait, those valuations just tend to tend to come down, um, just the natural supply and demand. As you come in a little bit, and maybe a little bit more generally too, like anything services oriented is still holding up quite well. I'm um, thinking kind of recession, recession resistant, non-discretionary spend um, has held up pretty well. Things that are probably more attributable to discretionary spend uh, have probably been a little bit lighter and a little bit softer as people try and read the read the tea leaves under underneath of that. Um, on you know, valuations overall and, and trying just to, to answer the question that, that came in um, at, at the same time. Um, but I think over time, valuations tend to and will reflect whatever the most recent round is. Now, what gets challenging is, okay, a company hasn't raised, and talking like VC company specifically, hasn't raised in two years, maybe. How stale is that valuation? What does that look like in, in today's market? There are some games you can play with with sort of a highly structured round that keeps the, the valuation the same, but really doesn't look the same. Um, and so there are some, some games you can play with that. Um, overall, though, I think we've seen things get marked closer to market. And ultimately, like once everyone goes through a capital raising cycle, um, there will be more companies that go out of business because they aren't able to raise capital at, at any valuation. Um, and many that that hang in and do some at lower valuation, some some at the same. I recall talking to one of our VC managers, this was probably Q3 of last year. Um, and his comment that he got back from auditors as, as well was that you probably won't see true valuations come through until the Q4 2023 marks. And so that's even foretelling what this looks like and how long it takes to, to actually play out. Because once you've raised $150 million, if you try, you can make that last a, a, a long time. And I think a lot of the uh, the venture-backed companies kind of realize how much runway they had once they you know tighten their belt a little bit on expenses. Right. So it, it speaks uh, to an important point that, you know, in today's environment, it's it's less interesting as a GP to be a seller in today's environment with, you know, valuations down, with prices down uh, overall. And so that creates, you know, environment where you have portfolio holding companies where all else equal, a GP might be excited about the business. They think it's a, 
a great and interesting prospect, but they don't really want to sell at today's valuations. So, Angelique, talk to us a bit about what that's doing to you know, GP portfolio construction and how that might be extending and kind of the pros and cons for GPs and the, the risks there and what that means to, to LPs as well. Yeah, yeah. So really, you know, what we're talking about here is extension risk. Um, you know, I, I think everyone has heard the term the impending maturity wall, which sounds really scary, but it really just means that funds are, you know, coming to the end of their basically allotted timeline, right, or their fund life. And LPs are expecting those distributions back from the company realizations, right? They want their money back. Um but because of the modest exit environment, distributions have been lower, which means that there is a risk of the fund, you know, extending past their typical life. Um, and, and by the way, you know, this plays a very big part in the fundraising environment, which has also really struggled. LPs, if they don't have sort of cash coming in to commit to new GPs or to commit to re-ups, Right. If they're not getting that from a distribution standpoint, then they're not going to turn around and, and invest it. So it has negatively impacted the fundraising environment. I had a conversation recently with a friend who runs a private equity portfolio for a large single family office. And she said that this is the first time she can remember in probably a decade or so where her capital calls, money going out of the portfolio, were greater than her distributions or money coming into the portfolio. Meaning, you know, for the year, she's cash flow negative. And that just puts LPs in a tough spot because most rely on their private equity portfolio to really be self-funding. Um, so we're hearing that, you know, quite a bit from peers. It's certainly very evident in the public pension space. Um, we fortunately have not run into that as much. Again, we play in the lower middle market and there has been more activity in that space um, because the larger firms, you know, they're buying from smaller sponsors. They're buying add-on acquisitions. Um, and then, you know, another, I guess, uh, a comment I'll just make is I was in LA last week meeting with a couple of our special situations managers. So think carve outs, uh, maybe more complex deals in terms of the, the transaction dynamics. And they're actually seeing a ton of activity and, and pacing, you know, at or above expectations. So again, it really depends on, you know, where you're playing. Right. No, it makes perfect sense. And by the way, uh, you know, we're getting into the last, you know, couple of minutes here. So if you have more questions, please continue to put them in the queue. We have a few coming through. Um, you know, so Michael, since I had put valuations to you, we had a question come in um, here on, look, is this the new normal uh, for private equity? You know, have we just exited perhaps the renaissance of, you know, growth and venture capital with zero bound interest rates? And now we're in a uh, a more typical environment, or has the amount of capital that's been raised in private markets and aggregate going to dwarf that, uh, and we'll just get back off into the races? What are your What are your thoughts there? Yeah, I, I I think we're probably closer to to new normal, and kind of parlaying some of what Angelique was saying too. The closer you are to public markets as an avenue for exit, and so that's larger funds and or venture capital, the more tied you will be to the openness of that window. IPOs have been very light. That's impacted venture capital. That's impacted some of the larger deals whose most natural exit is, is through IPO. Um, and so you're seeing that. And I think the expectation should be that, at least going in, that that is what we would expect to see going forward. There will be a window where the IPO is more open than it is today. Um, but we had a period of time from 19 to you know 2021 where it was very open and, and wide open and a ton of capital was was realized. Um, and we see that oftentimes with, with VC is they'll, they'll be those times where a lot can, the market can take a lot. Um, and so they, they'll tend to pile in there and then they should be piling in there in terms of exiting. Um, and then there will be periods of, of slowness as, as well. So I do think this is just more natural phenomenon and capital markets disruption too, is what we call it, as opposed to really, we haven't seen a ton of true economic disruption to this point. Um, certainly some, some things are stickier than they used to be, but overall it's, it's maintained largely in the, in the capital markets. Yeah. And I think it's important to investors just remember 
right? Like th things like recessions, right? Those are a normal part of economic expansion and contraction. They have they happen about every eight years or so. The idea that a IPO window would be open or private markets are outperforming or underperforming, that's just the same as small caps or large caps are outperforming or underperforming. These are part of kind of cyclical opportunities of which we have to be, you know, thoughtfully navigating on the fringes and making sure that we're partnering with the right uh, investments over time. Um, you know, to that end, you know, maybe Angelique in the last couple of minutes here, I know you you alluded to this a bit just in kind of how lower leverage, how control and operations that those, you know, at least the approach that we take has benefited in this environment. You know, I know we have our own kind of strategy for success, if you will, right? The tenets of which we uh, seek and continue to seek going forward. Maybe just kind of a quick in our last few moments, just, you know, what those tenets are and why we think, you know, even more so going forward, you know, they can be a beneficial positioning of how we think about allocating capital in the space. Yeah, absolutely. So at any given point in time, there are thousands of funds out there raising capital, right? So we need to have a very efficient way to sort of narrow that funnel to get to the best ideas. And we do that through our sort of philosophical approach, right? So you mentioned kind of three key tenants, you know, the first being size. So just where do we want to play in the market? You know, we tend to gravitate toward funds less than a billion. So again, lower middle market, um, a less efficient space, more opportunities to, to win, frankly. Um, we tend to gravitate toward managers that have an operational lens. So specialist in some way, you know, groups that really understand the fundamentals of the business. So they are adding value by building out a sales team, by expanding geographically, by augmenting the management team, which should result in increased revenues, increased earnings, you know, business fundamentals, as opposed to relying on leverage for returns. And then sort of the, the third kind of key tenant there is really just strong GP alignment. Um, these are illiquid vehicles. They are long life funds. You know, you want to know that you trust this partner, you trust this group, that they're going to do what's right for the LPs, that they're going to make money because of strong performance, not just on management fees, um, which is actually one of the reasons why we're very active in the emerging manager space. So those are sort of the three key tenants um, and how that you know helps us, again, narrow that funnel to source and diligence our, our highest conviction ideas. Um, that's where we look. Maybe I'll just, maybe I'll turn it over to, to Mike though, just to turn to talk about kind of the layers of, of risk mitigation, which is also really important. Yeah. I mean, I, I think just to, just to round that out, the, the areas in which it's not just about owning private equity, but where within private equity do you, do you actually own or what, what part do you own and finding the, the, the spaces uh, that Angelique described well of, just where are the structural and persistent areas where we're going to outperform over time? And it's really about boiling it down to, to those characteristics and then and then going in and finding those those great managers that will outperform. And then also layering on the, the levels of risk. So at the manager level, that's essentially the diligence process in weeding those out. At the portfolio level, it's not only owning venture capital, where you're only going to see pockets of liquidity when the IPO market is wide open, but owning a diversified mix of buyout growth, venture capital, distress and special situations managers. Um, and then at the next level up, um, how are we committing capital to make sure that it's not all gone in at once? We have a lot of capital called and then expect a lot of distributions, but layering that over time and, and balancing out the vintage years um, so that we end up in this steady state, steady state cash flow profile of capital calls are coming back, uh, or capital calls are, are being called, distributions are coming back, and those are roughly equal, hopefully always a little weighted to, to distributions, but roughly equal over time. Perfect. Well, I know we're at the half hour here. So, 
you know, if we didn't get to your question, please feel free to reach out. We're happy to address it. But Michael, Angelique, thank you so much for the time and insights. Angelique also recently authored a paper, which is on our website, which has a lot more of the data behind our discussions. So if you have interest, please go there. We're always happy to share it to you if you want to reach out. So with that, we appreciate everyone's time uh, and we'll, uh, we'll talk to you all soon. Thanks so much.